My fiance and I are from California, but her family lives in Colorado, and they own a cabin near Pikes Peak, way up in the mountains. After visiting them, they recommended that we stay at the cabin a few days. We were avid hikers and jumped at the opportunity. Colorado is very rich in Native American folklore. Virtually every place you go used to belong to an indigenous community, and the few of them who remain keep the traditions and stories alive. Pikes Peak is no different. There are enough stories, and uh, gift shops, to give anybody the sense that the land itself is alive. I don't know if this has anything to do with what's happening, but maybe someone here is from Colorado and can help us connect the dots. Faye and I are currently at the cabin. Day four, and we're planning on leaving today, but things have gotten very strange around here. And it looks like we're going to be here a while longer. We have enough food for a winter, and the heater is in stellar order, but the Wi-Fi is terrible at best. There's virtually no cell reception. We feel isolated. I'll try to respond to comments, but the internet dips out for a few hours. And the first weird thing that happened was the snow. See, there was no snow in the forecast. So we packed light. But on our first night here, just our luck, a blizzard pounded the whole area. And my little Corolla is basically a brick of ice outside, and there's no way I'm going to try to make the six-mile drive down the mountain to town. I blame myself for trusting Colorado in spring. After a day, Thursday, of lovely hiking and sightseeing, some really unsettling stuff started happening. When we returned to the cabin just before dusk, we found an enormous dream catcher dangling from a tree about a dozen yards from the back door. This wasn't the kind you were imagining, the kind you buy from a novelty shop. This thing was made from twigs and twine, and it's about three feet in diameter. Absolutely humongous. Neither Faye nor I was stupid enough to touch it. We're veteran horror movie fans, and we know that's how you get cursed. If the snow melts a bit, I'll go back out there and snap a picture of it posted here, but that night, while we were eating dinner, heard a bunch of noises in the woods outside, twigs crunching, leaves rustling, etc. This isn't unusual because we saw some elk and deer on our hike, but the sounds were slow and purposeful. They stopped and started and were rhythmic, like someone was casing the area in a crescent shape around the cabin. I used my really bright tactile flashlight to look outside from the porch, but there was nothing. We stayed in all day on Friday and just cuddled and hung out. Played some of the board games we brought and some of the Super Nintendo games that they had in the cabin, which is like Donkey Kong Country 2, that I've considered stealing, but it's the greatest game ever made. It snowed again. After dark, we started hearing more noises. Around 1 a.m., Faye woke up and told me that she was hearing a voice outside. I strained to listen, and I thought that I could make out the sound of a man crying very far away, but his voice was drowned out by a wind. I wasn't absolutely certain of what I heard. I went back to sleep, but again, around 4.45 a.m., we heard him more distinctly and closer. It sounded like he was crying for help. But he would dip into another language that I've never heard before. We called the ranger station at the bottom of the hill using my cell phone. They told us that they'd get up there and check it out. We never saw them, and I doubt they ever came. On Saturday, shit was getting really crazy. It snowed again in the morning, and I stopped getting service for most of the day. Faye and I watched movies, and I, I tried to Skype with her family, but that didn't work. She went to sleep early around 8, while I did some photo editing on my laptop in the living room. She woke up crying hysterically. When I asked her what was wrong, she said that she she had a dream that she was lost in the woods outside, and something was following her. I cuddled her until she fell back asleep, and eventually I drifted off too. Faye woke up around 1 a.m. She was absolutely beside herself. I'd never seen her so afraid in my life, and just the look on her face really unsettled me. She told me that she heard the man outside again, but she recognized the voice. She was absolutely convinced that it was her grandfather's voice, that he was wandering around outside begging for help. Faye's grandpa died when we were seniors in college four years ago. I told her that she was dreaming, but then I heard the voice too. I never met the guy, so I wouldn't recognize his voice, but it, it did sound different from the night before. It sounded older. I had to do everything I could to keep her from running off into the woods looking for him. And eventually she realized that the possibility of it being him was absurd. So he put on a movie, on in a good volume, and fell back asleep. My cell phone wouldn't connect a single call. 
What happened last night, Sunday, was the thing that sent me over the edge. Essentially the same thing happened. Around 1am, at which point I was still awake, almost expecting the noise to happen, I heard a voice. This time it was a woman's. Thankfully it was distant enough that it didn't wake Faye. I walked into the bathroom and cracked the window open just a tiny bit. Frosty air that came through the crack seemed like a death sentence to me as, as a Californian. Nobody could survive outside for long in that, not without serious military-grade winter gear. And yet someone was wandering the fuck around out there, stepping on twigs, crying. I'm a reasonable, skeptical, sometimes arrogant agnost, but I'll tell you, the voice sounded exactly like my mother's. My mom is alive and well, and living in Southern California, so my brain instantly cramped at the sound of her voice in here in the Rocky Mountains. I, I would know my mother's voice anywhere. I think we all would, and I'm telling you, I'm about 90% sure it was her. Which is way, way too sure to not scare the shit out of me. I grabbed my light and went outside with a blanket wrapped around me and my hiking boots on. I circled the entire cabin and looked around. There was snow pushed out of the way and a big meandering pattern that snaked in and out of the tree line, like someone was drunkenly shuffling about. Maybe they were injured. The path went right up to the beside the window and then back into the woods. Each time the voice called out, I shouted, Mom? Or, Who's there? Or, Who are you? And each time the voice receded further into the woods. I'm pretty certain it was trying to coax me deeper and deeper into the forest, away from the cabin. I'm still alive, because I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to die like some dumbass in a bad horror movie. I went back inside and made sure that we were locked down tight. Since I couldn't call the ranger station, I'm posting this instead. To keep you all updated. It's Monday. We got a hold of Faye's dad. The weather's supposed to clear up tomorrow, so he's going to come pick us up in his truck and help get my car down the mountain. I'll keep you all informed. Only one more night in this place. I'll try to get some photos up. I've been able to get back online twice today. I wish I knew more about electronics, but I'm a history teacher, so I don't think I can fix the Wi-Fi or predict when it'll work. I can send and receive emails and some Reddit posts, but I can't load some websites or photos. Faye hasn't been feeling well since noon. She developed a stomach ache and has been intermittently throwing up. We both ate the same thing, and I feel fine, so I'm not sure what it is. She sometimes gets like this when she gets worked up, although I'm, I'm an agnost or an atheist. She is very Catholic, and is pretty convinced that something supernatural is going on. No need for alarm at the moment. She doesn't have a fever, and I'm keeping her hydrated and in high spirits. She seems to be on the mend. I went to sleep around an hour and a half ago. The noises to report, crackling, repetitive vocalizations in the forest, probably a hundred yards out. Tree line starts at about twenty yards out, so the sound is coming from much deeper. Some movement spotted just behind the tree line at dusk. Could have been a deer, an elk, something else. Couldn't see very much. Keeping all the curtains closed, the windows locked, and furniture in front of the front door and back door, I'm checking on Faye every half hour. Her dad will be here late in the morning to pick us up and dig out my car. Another Redditor near us pointed out that I am an idiot for not double-checking the weather, and you are correct. I promise. I'll provide an update as a new post tomorrow, should anything significant happen. I'm sorry for the delay, everyone. We're collecting ourselves. Sorry for any uh, formatting issues as well. I'm writing this on my phone. Faye's dad picked us up in his truck. He brought his buddy with him too, who is now following us in my car. And a lot of things happened last night. Some things I won't share because I'm not sure how to interpret them yet. I'm not even sure I understand what's happened. But here are the most important things. I also managed to get some recordings, which I'll try to upload when we get to California in a few days. I tried to stay awake last night until 1 a.m. because over the past few nights, it's the appropriate time the noises change from rustling branches and crackling to voices. I didn't make it. I fell asleep on the couch with my laptop open, waiting for the Wi-Fi to come back. I think this is about 12.30 a.m. 
I woke up right around 1.15 a.m. to a muffled voice. In my sleepy days, I struggled to figure out where it was coming from. I thought it was just outside the living room window, so I sat there quietly, trying to make the words out. It was a woman's voice and said things like a few days. It's not mine. I'm not alone. Okay. I got up and peeked out the curtain and didn't see anyone. But then the voice said, It's my parents' house. And I knew the voice was Faye's. As I mentioned earlier, my fiancé has an undiagnosed sleep disorder and has extensive sleep talk and sometimes sleepwalks, as she had pronounced night terrors since she was a little kid. I posted a story on that Sunday. I walked into the bedroom to find Faye sleeping on her tummy as usual. She didn't say anything else as I came in. Two things really disturbed me about the situation, though. The first is that she appeared to have a conversation with someone, which is actually quite common for her. But the person she was conversing with was interrogating her, asking her questions about herself, me, the cabin, etc. Second, in her sleep, Faye was imitating another voice. It wasn't hers that she was speaking with. She was altering the pitch and tone to sound like a different person. My modus operandi is not to wake her up when she has sleep disturbances. There's a story behind this, expect one one day. Instead, I gently rub her back and hair, which calms her, and puts her back to restful sleep. I did this for a few minutes, but then there was another noise off in the distance outside. I got up, walked to the window to listen, and I think this is the first time that I really felt scared enough that I felt like we were in real danger. It was a child, singing in the dark. I couldn't really make out much of what he or she was saying. But I'm certain that it was a child, probably aged six to eight, trying to sing a song. The snow had abated for a while now, and the stars were notably bright. So I could see all the way to the rim of the forest, about, about 20 yards out. There was a figure standing there just past the first trees back facing me, looking up at either the moon or the tops of the trees, it had stood so still that I convinced myself it was a tree stump or something. And in a few minutes, no longer visible. My skeptical nature compels me to be reasonable and say my eyes were playing tricks on me. And when I turned around, Faye was sitting straight up in bed, eyes closed. She does that a lot in her sleep. She craned her neck and said something like, don't let them in. Don't let them inside. She was still doing the weird voice. Faye and I sat in the bedroom with the lights on, talking about what we should do. I tried to get online to send an email to her parents, but of course it doesn't work when you need it. We agreed to stay in the same room to try to fall back asleep. At one point, I got up to get her some water. She hadn't vomited in several hours now and was feeling a lot better. And out in the kitchen window, I saw a flash of pale light. It went like the flashes you'd see when someone's walking through the woods like a, with a flashlight. But more like if someone had a lantern that they could slowly turn on and off. I flicked on the porch lights in the front and the side of the house, hoping that it would discourage anyone from trying to approach. But as I walked back to the bedroom, I saw the distinct outline of a person through the window. They were pressed against the glass with their hands on it, trying to peer inside. Since it was dark in the living room and bright outside, I could clearly see their silhouette. I shouted and approached the window, but the person ran off before I pulled the curtain open. They slept soundly. But I continued to hear voices outside. Different ones. On and off, all night until dawn. I wrote several of them off. I couldn't sleep, so I, I camped outside the living room. I kept the bedroom door open so I could hear Faye if she started talking again. The voices would go away for hours, then start back up again. At one point, I fell asleep because I was awoken by the sound of a light switch flicking on and off. From the couch, I could see the light from outside, going on and off in patterns of five. I couldn't explain why this disturbed me so much, but it did. And I imagined some kind of horrible creature standing in my house somewhere, flipping the switch up and down, smiling. My first instinct was to check on Faye. I nearly had a heart attack when I saw that she wasn't in bed. I started calling her name and pacing around the house, looking out the windows to see if she was outside. 
but I looked out the kitchen window, there she was, standing on the hood of my car about 30 feet out in the driveway. Her back was to me and she was staring off into the forest. She was absolutely rigid, just the way that she sat up in bed when she was asleep. Faye had sleepwalked all over the house back home in California. I found her in the kitchen and downstairs in the hallway in the living room, but she'd never gone outside. I shouted her name from the kitchen, but the second I did, Faye jumped off the car and dashed into the woods at full sprint. She never looked back at me. I started flipping out and screaming her name over and over. I scrambled to grab my boots and to go to her, but the second I pulled the front door open, Faye called out my name from behind. She was standing in the hall, looking confused, asking me what was wrong. Apparently, she had been in the bathroom. In my masculine crusade, I'd forgot to check there. I looked out at my car in the forest, and honestly, the first thought that came to mind was, you clever motherfucker. Needless to say, we stayed up the remaining few hours until dawn, intermittently writing down the voices that we heard which faded away and became less frequent with the passage of time. I'll try to get the recordings up in a few days, for now, here's a list of voices that we heard. We recall some of the voices from the previous nights from memory, but we just figured that you'd like to know what was being said throughout the duration of this lovely cabin experience. I'll return to Colorado. Fuck Pike's Peak. The man's voice vaguely familiar, but we couldn't put a face to it. Hello? Oh, God, look at it. Look. Hello? Don't. Don't, if they can see in the dark. I'm lost. I'm lost. It's very dark. I see those lights. I'll come down here. Don't smile, I see you. A woman's voice sounded age 20-ish. <gasps> Lay it on the ground and burn it. La, 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 la. She talks in her sleep. She's talking to me now. She talks in her sleep. She's talking to me now. Voice of my mother a few nights ago. Stop! <laughs> Stop! Look at the windows. Did you see it? A child. Sounded about maybe six or eight years old. Oh, soul me. Uh, why do I do eat, eat, eat? I am a... Vacant soul. Me, I do. Me, I do. When do we go inside? Voice of Faye's grandmother, a few nights ago. Oh, oh, oh. These bodies still on the ground here. Never found them, but they're here. Right here. Right here. Oh, they found it. They found it. Oh, I'm standing in the same place. Twenty years. Twenty years. By the way, I forgot to check to see if that Dreamcatcher was still out there in the back. You're welcome to drive out there. Look for yourself, though. We've begun hearing voices outside of our home. He is really upset and feels that I might have exacerbated these strange circumstances by giving them widespread exposure online. I'm gonna go dark for a few days. See if that helps. Don't worry about us. We have a few close friends looking out for us. They know the entire story. 
Hi, everyone. I just want to make a quick update, as promised. Because Faye and I are flying back to California shortly. Faye is back to normal, feeling great. I watched her eat a huge plate of chicken parmesan yesterday. First thing I should mention is that Faye's father was very reluctant to talk about the cabin or the weird experiences that we've had there. He kept trying to change the subject and was generally in a bad mood, which is pretty normal for him. He's a really grumbly Vietnam vet and um, he's been in the army since he was young. His personality is exactly the way that you'd imagine it. Faye asked him bluntly if something's wrong with that cabin. Why would you let us go up there in the first place? And his response was, talk to your mother. So that night we sat down with Faye's mom, Laura, in her bedroom while her dad was watching the news downstairs. Her mom was so upset at the stories we told her. I mean, she was visibly disturbed to the point of being in tears. She kept apologizing to Faye and hugging her. And Laura told us that they'd purchased the cabin from their good friend, um, Jennifer, uh, I think who moved to Nevada about 20 years ago, and that Jennifer and her husband had complained about all sorts of weird experiences while living there. Her husband Tom, like myself, was fond of hiking and exploring the woods, and collected tons of arrowheads and other neat trinkets that he'd found on his travels around Pikes Peak. But Jennifer started having dreams about Tom being dragged off into the woods from their bedroom. She had all kinds of horrific nightmares about him being skinned and pinned up in the trees like some kind of macabre artwork. Jennifer said that while Tom was at work, she would occasionally hear the voice of her daughter, who died in childhood of some kind of bone cancer, calling Mommy on the edge of the forest. Jennifer's doctor claimed that it was the medication that she was on and changed her meds. Tom got a new job in Vegas, and they basically noped out of here. On a lighter note, Tom hanged himself in the garage two years after they moved. No note or anything. Anyway, Laura, Faye's mom, and Greg, Faye's dad, only used the cabin as a getaway in the summer. Laura never experienced anything beyond weird feelings while she was there, and she chalked that up to all the crazy stories that Jennifer had told her. Greg, however, who suffers from PTSD-related nightmares occasionally, had experienced exacerbated sleep disturbances in the cabin. Over the years, he'd become reluctant to go there, and claimed that all the things he'd seen in Vietnam came back to him while he slept there. Allegedly, some of the people he saw get killed would come back to talk to him in his dreams at that cabin. The last time that he stayed there, he woke up in a dream to find a few of them sitting in his bedroom with him. Maimed, rotted, etc. He privately maintained to Laura that he also heard their voices in the forest. Crying, begging, screaming for their mothers. Oh, and take a guess at what time he heard them. Laura told us that she honestly did not believe there was anything really wrong with the cabin. Faye was extremely pissed and let her have it. They kind of ended our visit on a bad note. But later that night, I was up reading and Faye was sleeping next to me. She always falls asleep before me. A girl could fall asleep in a pile of rocks. She started mumbling in her sleep, so I listened carefully. And there was... A few things that I heard her say. Never. Never, never, no, I wouldn't. On the mountain. You can't. Why? His name? We don't know you. No, it's Felix, which is my name. A few hours later, she woke me up by nudging me in her sleep and saying, Tell the man in the hall. Leave. Now, this set me over the edge, so I got up to go to the bathroom and get some water. Now, I didn't find anything strange. Had a very hard time falling asleep, though. This morning, we heard back from the guy who went up to the cabin to check on that gas leak of the carbon monoxide at the behest of a few scrupulous Redditors. The guy mentioned that radon is a really big problem in some of those old places in the mountains. Some kind of super badass handyman with all kinds of equipment, so... He wrangled up one of those peak rangers, and they went up to the place together. Apparently there were tracks all over the house, dozens of pairs of them, like a large group of people who'd been wandering around looking in the windows. All the windows and doors were sealed the way that we left them. When they got inside, some stuff was moved around. The silverware drawer was emptied onto the kitchen floor, turned them upside down. The power was completely dead. The weirdest thing was that there was water all over the bed and on the floor but a guy checked for leaks in the ceiling and the bathroom pipes, nothing. 
Nothing had been stolen from the house, not even food. Some of the old clothes in the bedroom closet were strewn onto the ground, but nothing stolen. Like maybe someone was trying them on. Smelling them. The ranger said that there was... There were legends about the mountain. Something about... Things that sort of act like people. But they come out of the old abandoned mines. Greg's friend couldn't remember the name the ranger gave them. It was a native language. I asked Greg to ask the ranger about the sounds. Specifically, the, the wachu, wachu, uh, wolmai, wolmai. And he said that it's a widely recognized chant, but, but he, didn't, he didn't know what it means. I mean, if anyone here has any ideas, feel free. However, there's no radon, no carbon monoxide, no gas. The place is all electric. He checked for mold, but said that it was unlikely that there would be any all the way up here. He said it's possible that there's some kind of electrical problem, and that's, that's what can sometimes cause people to feel very unsettled and maybe have hallucinations. He said that he has a kind of Geiger counter or a gadget that detects issues like this, but it was broken when he tried to use it. I'm going to keep a close eye on Faye. She's still shaken up about all this. If there's anything left to report... I'll let you all know. Faye and I flew back from Colorado on Wednesday afternoon. She slept the entire flight despite the noise, which amazed me. I can't sleep on planes because I'm absolutely terrified of flying. I'd rather stay another night in the cabin. When we got home, I ordered a pizza and she wolfed it down. Her appetites returned in full force, which is great news. I mentioned this in my original post, but Faye has an undiagnosed sleep disorder. She has pronounced night terrors, sleep talking, and occasional sleepwalking. This disorder lies dormant 90% of the time, but it tends to flare up when she's under a lot of stress. If we're moving, she changes jobs. Or if a relative dies, I can expect a night of horrifying talks and odd behavior. Needless to say, our experiences of the cabin have set Faye on edge. Although she's in high spirits, she's still afraid at night. I am too. That night after pizza, she fell asleep on the couch while watching Wedding Crashers. At around 10 p.m., the movie ended, and I turned the TV off. As I brought our plates to the kitchen, I passed by the stairwell and heard a faint noise from upstairs. It sounded like a man sighing. I shrugged it off and woke Faye up. We brushed our teeth and went to bed. Faye talked in her sleep a lot that night, and it started around 1 a.m. I woke up to her calling out, What did you do? And, do you need help? And laughing. See, this isn't really unusual for her. She babbled occasionally, said a few things, except I woke up again around four and heard her talking, but this time, she was doing something she's never done before. We've been together for almost five years, and not once has she ever whispered in her sleep, but now she was whispering with her back turned to me. For a second, I thought someone was lying on the floor at the edge of her bed, talking back to her. This disturbed the shit out of me, so I sat up and leaned over her trying to listen in the dark. The only thing I heard her say was, Shh. I asked her, Faye, what are you talking about? She didn't respond. I said, Who are you talking to? She replied, Don't. And nudged me. Another unusual thing happened. About 5.45 a.m., I woke up to Faye getting back into bed. She hurried into the bedroom from the hall and got back into bed quickly, making zero attempt not to wake me up. First of all, Faye does not get up, ever. She sleeps like a dead horse, and even if she went to the bathroom in the middle of the night, which she never does, the bathroom is not down the hall. It's in our bedroom. When I asked her what she was doing the next morning, she claimed that she had no memory of it. I spent all day Thursday thinking about why Faye was still acting weird. I was the one who found the dream catcher, got too close to it. I was the one who interacted with the voices of the cabin. And then I remembered something. In our, in our last night in Colorado, at her parents' house, Faye got back into bed around the same time, 5.45 a.m. I barely remembered because I was half asleep. But the image returned to my head. She'd been getting up really, really early for a few days. So last night, I set my phone alarm to vibrate. I put the time to 4.45 a.m. in the middle of the night. Faye started talking again. This time, she was... She's doing the same thing she did at the cabin, changing her voice to sound like someone else. In five years, she sleep-talked a bunch, but has never whispered or changed her voice until recently. 
she said a few things uh, which I can uh, try to commit to memory. La, 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 la. Very flat and monotone. Sha. More like, a, like a, an exhale followed by Deon Tail. Or something like that. Over and over. He's still in the trees. Where are you? I looked for you. And oh, it's time. About the same time I heard a noise outside which sounded like an old man grumbling to himself about something. We live in North Cow, which is really woodsy outside. So when you look out our bedroom window, there are tons of trees around the street. It's very dark, but I'm fairly, I'm fairly certain I saw a man walking behind the first line of trees. It's too far away to be the one that's grumbling, but it's very unusual to see anyone out there this time of night. In fact, I've never seen anyone there this time of night, ever. Looking outside required me to open the curtains, which lit up the room with moonlight. When I looked back at the bed, Faye was laying there with her neck craned towards me, her eyes crazy wide and fixed on me. Her mouth was open. She issued this really frightening, gurgling, drawn-out groan, flicked her tongue around. It looked like looked like a, an, a, an epileptic fit in slow motion. Faye has definitely opened her eyes in her sleep, but never like this. She looked like a fucking murderer. I got scared. I called her name really loud and woke her up. She was confused and asked me why I was at the window. I lied and said that I was just closing it because it was cold. I didn't want her to know that I heard a voice. We talked a bit. I'll skip that because this is, it's, this is getting long. My alarm woke me up at 4.45 a.m. and I laid there awake waiting for Faye to get up like she had in the past few nights. She breathes very rhythmically when she's asleep, so I can always tell how deep she's under. Around 5.20, she sat straight up, swung her legs over the bed, and tiptoed down the hall. I followed her. When I say that my fiancé tiptoed, I didn't mean like a child on Christmas. This was robotic, alien, inhuman. She moved like a meth-addicted ballerina zombie down the hall and stopped at the stairwell. My breathing never changed. I just stood there in our bedroom, poking my head out into the dark hall. Faye looked down the stairs, still standing rigidly on the balls of her feet, swaying to and fro slightly. She did some weird shit. She touched her face slowly for several minutes, touched the banister, touched the wall, flicked the light on and off a few times, all the while maintaining her perfectly regular coma breathing. And she reached an arm out in the motion of a bicep curl. Stretched her fingers and wiggled them, curled them, her hand, and her arm back up to her face. I watched her do this motion about four, four minutes. It looked like she was testing the limb, as if she'd never used it before. Then I realized she was actually communicating with someone on the first floor of the house. She was making a come hither motion with full confidence that Faye was sleepwalking I walked into the hall and leaned over the half wall that looked to the living room it was totally dark down there I couldn't see anything but the clock on the cable box Faye stood there waving smiling making gestures then touching her face and pulling gently on her hair I carefully ushered her back to bed and talked to her softly, trying not to actually wake her. She didn't resist, she never does. He went back to sleep without any word. I have zero clue what the fuck is going on. I told her this morning what she did, and now, now we have a doctor's appointment for her today at 3 p.m. I have no fucking clue what's going on. I took Faye to see her doctor yesterday, and we hesitantly explained what was going on with her. I left out the paranormal stuff because I didn't want to get put in a ward. So she, she seemed really concerned about Faye, ordered a blood test, gave her a physical, asked her about her diet, and drugs, medications, etc. Faye and I are both non-drinkers, non-drug users, and neither of us on medication. She wants Faye to be evaluated by a psychiatrist next week. For now, she gave her a sedative at night and some anti-anxiety medication. She wants us to get some fresh air and get out of the house, so we're going on a hike today. 
Someone brought up the possibility that the child's voice outside the cabin asking, when do we go inside, when do we go inside, might might not refer to inside the cabin, but rather inside Faye. It really worries me because it corroborates some of the strange behaviors that she's been exhibiting in her sleep. I contacted the park ranger, who is pretty sympathetic to our situation, and he's going to get in touch with some of the members of his tribe who have experienced with spiritual guidance and medication. He's convinced that Faye and I have attracted the attention of the ones who come out of the mines. Lucky us. More on that later. Some others have recommended that I test Faye, see if that's really her. So yesterday evening, against my wallet's advice, I took her to our favorite steakhouse. I only ever order one meal here. Medium tri-tip, house macaroni and cheese, and a bottled root beer. Faye only ever orders one meal there too. Barbecued chicken, mac and cheese, and a salad with ranch dressing, and a Coke. She drinks Coke only. Her blood is mostly Coca-Cola. Faye took a long time deciding what to order, and ended up ordering a fucking New York strip. I jokingly told her to order one for me, and she said, I don't know what you want. She also ordered water instead of Coke. Usually we have arguments over how much Coke she drinks, and how I'm always trying to get her to hydrate better and just drink water. This is really unsettling to me. At the end of the night, when we were walking back to my car, I kissed her temple and asked if she really liked it when I called her Noodle. She said, of course. See, I've never called her Noodle in my entire life. Her nickname has always been Monkey Toast. Long story. When we got home, she cracked open a Coke and got on Facebook, which is completely normal for her. This threw me off. One thing that's been on my mind lately is the song the little kid was singing outside the cabin. For those of you who don't know, in the middle of the night at this cabin in Colorado, we heard a child's voice coming out of the forest singing eerie songs. I've been catching myself humming it almost every day. I asked Faye if it meant anything to her, and I sang it to her while she was sitting on the couch. After a few repetitions, she sort of went blank like she was hypnotized and just wobbled back and forth ever so slightly for about eight seconds, and snapped out of it and said, I don't remember that. Last night's when the shit hit the fan, so you have... I haven't gotten a full night's rest in over a week now, and it's starting to make me feel over-emotional and crazy. Faye started murmuring in her sleep around one. As usual, I couldn't understand much of it. She sat up in bed, took the sheets off her legs like she was going to sit up, but I grabbed her arm and asked her what she was doing. She said, tell them to leave. Her eyes were completely shut. I asked her who. Who needs to leave? She sat there for about two minutes, not speaking, just sitting straight up. I asked her again, and she replied, There's a man at the door. And about ten seconds later, and a woman at the bottom of the stairs. Of course. This made every single hair on my entire body bristle. I got up and went downstairs, turning on every single light as I went, and carrying my buck knife with me. Nobody was in the house. I looked in every single room downstairs and even in the backyard, and when I got back to the stairwell, I heard someone stomping around upstairs. Someone had turned the light to the upstairs hallway off. I stood at the bottom of the stairs looking up, trying to listen, but the noises stopped. So I walked back up into our bedroom and got into the bed. It was likely that Faye had gotten up to go to the bathroom or sleepwalked a bit in the room and went back to sleep. I went to sleep pretty fast but woke up again only a few minutes later. Faye was gone. I heard movement down the hall, so I looked out into it and saw Faye coming out of the other bedroom. She staggered down the hall towards me, then stopped, turned around, and walked back in the other direction. She did this eight times. She was walking in almost the same way as the night before, standing really high up on her toes, her legs totally rigid like they were made of cement, and her arms completely limp and flopping back and forth. It was extremely fucking terrifying seeing her move like that. She was totally graceless. It was like someone was testing out a human body for the first time. And at that same moment, I heard a noise through the bedroom window and ran over to check, thinking someone was really at the front door. But you, you could see down to the front entryway from the bedroom window. And off in the distance, about 30 yards out, somebody was walking back and forth in the exact same way that Faye was. He was humming loudly and intermittently singing. This, the song sounded like the one that I sang to Faye earlier. The one the child sang outside the cabin. 
Basically, I ran into the hall, woke Faye up, and brought her downstairs. I opened the front door to get a better look at the man. But he was gone. Today, at the behest of a few other people, I asked Faye if she'd ever been to the cabin before we visited it. I don't know why I never thought to ask her this before. She said nothing about it, and we stayed there for several nights. She was hesitant to answer me, and eventually admitted that she's been there once when she was 14. She and her parents were snowshoeing up the mountain. A few hours later, I emailed her mother and asked the same question. She told me that Faye had gone to the cabin multiple times as a child, but stopped going when she went to high school. I can't figure out which one is lying to me. Because so many people have questions about Faye, she's agreed to do a filmed interview. If you post questions for her, I'll film her responses and post them here within a few days. I haven't told Faye this, but I'm thinking of going back to the cabin and meeting with the ranger. He wants to do some rituals with the dream catcher that we found. If it's still there. And he says that he'll bring his friends and try to cleanse the house and the surrounding area. Now, this will cost me like $500 just to fly out there, but if this shit goes any worse, it might be worth it. Quick note. One of the Redditors sent me a private message telling me to investigate the guest room to see if Faye was doing anything in there. Turns out, she was. She had written the number 5 on the window with her finger. I only saw it because of the condensation from the cold room this afternoon. It's written backwards so that someone standing in our backyard could read it. I can't tell you how much all your support has meant to me over the past few days. They feel so good knowing that people are constantly asking about her health and feeling like a few of your suggestions have literally saved her life, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. I don't even know where to begin. So much has happened in the last two and a half days. The sedatives and anti-anxiety medicine the doctor gave Faye work during the day, and she has been less restless, less stressed. However, at night, her behavior is still highly unusual. I've taken the overwhelming consensus of Redditors seriously. I went out and purchased a bunch of childproofing materials for the house to prevent Faye from harming herself or going outside while sleepwalking. I couldn't afford a bunch of cameras, sorry. I, I bought these knob covers that little kids and hopefully sleepwalkers are too stupid to figure out. Outlet covers in case she tries to jam anything into them and I hid the kitchen knives. I also brought in a spiritual healer after very carefully searching for one. It's my opinion that 99% of them are frauds and hucksters. But this woman did not charge us anything, and she was recommended by close family. She was the daughter of a, uh, of a Shoshone tribe elder. The long and short of it is that she believes our home is haunted. However, she says that Faye feels very off. She said she couldn't get a good read on her at all, and that there's a dark cloud over her. Still suspicious of this woman, I took her to a random upstairs window and told her that I had seen something outside near the edge of the woods, mimicking Faye's sleepwalking, which was true, but I, I pointed out the wrong window to the wrong part of the house. She quietly examined the other windows upstairs and said that our bedroom window, the correct one, gave her a terrible feeling. She said, He watches from here. She can feel him whispering at night. I told her everything. She was horrified by our story. The look on her face unsettled me so much, it was like she'd never heard of anything this bad. She went out of the room and had to collect herself downstairs. The woman prayed for several minutes, sang a beautiful song in a language uh, that I can't even begin to describe, and saged our entire house. She put some kind of, of crushed herbs on the ground in front of the two doors that led into our home, and she told me in private, You're dealing with the hollowed one. She said its name in her ancestral language, but I can't even come close to remembering it or even spelling it. She said that one is infatuated with Faye and will do absolutely anything to get inside our house. But the process takes time. I don't know if I actually buy any of this, but at least, at least she didn't sell it to me. We also had Faye take a pregnancy test, as recommended by many editors. Um, the woman said it was a good idea. Good news, not pregnant, and the, the woman stood in the bathroom with her like a prison guard so that she couldn't fuck with the test. 
We then thanked the woman and she left. That night we attached a little jingle bell from Faye's Christmas-themed lingerie to a hair scrunchie and put it around her ankle. I'm such a light sleeper, there's no way that she'd be able to get out of bed without waking me. Faye fell asleep really fast due to the meds. Out like a light in a few minutes. I lay in bed thinking about the five that she wrote on the window in her sleep a few nights earlier. And reason that it meant 5 a.m. and not five days, as some others had speculated. Now, this makes sense because she'd been getting up at that time to sleepwalk every night, four nights now. Since the five was written backwards, facing the backyard, I reasoned that it was a signal to whoever or whatever was out there. She was going to try to let it inside. I eventually fell asleep, and I had a fucking horrifying dream. Something came into the house through the sliding glass door to the yard and walked up the stairs into our bedroom. I, I, it sat on the edge of our bed, rubbing face foot and staring at us. It was completely wreathed in shadows, and I couldn't, I couldn't see it at all except for a silhouette. I woke up soaked in sweat, and I couldn't fall back to sleep for a while. 5 a.m. rolls around. And the reliable little jingle bell woke me right up. In her sleep, Faye did something that she's never done before. She stood up on the bed, rigid as a board, and stared out the window. I couldn't, I couldn't really say stared because her eyes were closed, but she was alert, watching, listening. She remained there like a statue for at least five minutes. I also didn't move. I just watched. And then she slowly raised her hand and started waving it at someone outside. My skin crawled. And she did that. She definitely knew someone was there, even with her eyes shut. Faye then stepped off the bed and darted to the bedroom door, trying to get out of the hallway, but the childproof knob covering stopped her. She couldn't figure it out in her sleep. She did another thing that she's never done while sleepwalking. She got extremely angry and started pulling on the cover. She shrieked and growled like a trapped animal after about 30 seconds of this. She woke herself up. She started crying really hard and told me that her... In her nightmare, she had seen a man without a face walking through the halls of our home, whispering her name, looking for her. I sat up and talked with her for an hour, and then... And then we went back to sleep. When I woke up again, it was around 10 a.m. Faye was gone. The bedroom window was open. As I walked downstairs, I saw her in the backyard reading, and every single window in the entire house was open. It was like... 55 degrees outside. She told me that the smell of the sage made her nauseous and she wanted to get out of the house. I couldn't smell anything. I suggested that we go to the church downtown today to speak to the priest. She's Catholic. But she refused. So I had my buddy Kay, who's very, very devout Catholic, come over with some holy water and his crucifix. Apparently Kay told his priest what was going on, and the guy very reluctantly blessed the water and told us to call him. Faye was irritated that I'd done this without permission and waited outside while Kay set up a few little crosses and his big crucifix around the house. Faye refused to have any holy water put on her. She kept saying, I'm freezing, don't you dare. She's going to be super pissed when she finds out that I put the shit in her shampoo and conditioner bottles. She was in a really nasty mood all morning, but after we went out for lunch, she was feeling much better and agreed to film the interview video and answer questions from the Redditors. While filming, I noticed that she wasn't wearing her engagement ring and realized that she'd, she hadn't been wearing it for several days. I asked her where it was. She said it was in our luggage, which we've now only partially unpacked. But later, when I, when I checked, it wasn't there. See, I'm, I'm worried about this for several reasons. Um, I'll post the video as, as she watches and approves it. She's very self-conscious, except it would... Expect it within a few days. I've finally begun moving some more of the photos from the cabin onto my laptop, too. I can't bring myself to listen to those voice recordings yet. Since this is getting over long, flash forward to last night. I got up about 1am to pee and knocked the bell scrunchie off the bed. Faye had taken it off and was gone. I got angry and scared at the same time. I found her sitting in the stairs looking down into the dark spreading her arms open like she was trying to get a child to climb the staircase for its first time. She was smiling with her eyes closed. As I usually do, I gently got her up and walked her back to bed. When I laid down next to her, she leaned over with her eyelids still closed and said, 
they're gonna kill you. And then licked my face. I called her parents today to arrange a flight back to Colorado. They're paying for it. Her mom, Laura, admitted to me that something had happened to Faye as a child at the cabin. That's where her sleep disturbances started, when she was five. I had enough, and they could tell. They spoke with a ranger at Pikes Peak again, and he arranged for me to meet with him and his buddies from the tribe, who know the entire history of the area and all of the hauntings that other visitors have reported. Faye will be staying with my two best friends, R and J, and Jay's fiance. I've known all three of them ever since high school, and they're completely informed about these events. They'll be guarding her with their lives. In short, I'm going back to the cabin alone. I'll update soon, but no matter what happens, I'm not going to drag this out any further. I've polluted this place enough with my problems. Of course, when I say alone, I don't mean completely alone. Okay, I'm meeting the ranger and his friends there. His two friends are from his tribe... Uh, nation? Sorry, I don't know the correct terminology. And They're healers. See, they, they know all about Pike's Peak and the ongoing situations. I, I'm not going out easy. I drop Faye off at my friend's place and they're taking care of her. I'm heading to the airport now, no idea when I'll get back. It's been an interesting few days. I have so much to say, so I'm going to try to be terse, uh, so that, so that it's taken so long to report, I really am trying. All your questions and analysis of these events have really helped us through this struggle, and some of your observations are what brought me back here to Colorado. I landed in Denver International Airport two nights ago and stayed with Faye's parents in Arvada. While there, we all sat down and I basically forced them to tell me what's going on. A Redditor pointed out that Laura, Faye's mom, appeared to be lying or hiding something, and another one asked me if Faye had ever been to the cabin before, since her family owned it for almost three decades. I had never even thought of this. See, when I asked Faye, she said no, and that her parents just used it as a getaway a few times a year. Faye's mom had told me that she had been there multiple times when she was a child. This time, Faye's parents told me a different story. They claimed that this was the truth. Faye had been to the cabin as a toddler a few times. And she was five. Something happened to her. While Greg, Faye's father, and Faye were outside playing in the snow, they wandered off towards the edge of the forest to look in. She was following a voice. Greg was building a snowman and keeping his eye on her. They were only a few dozen yards apart. Allegedly, Greg heard Faye talking, answering questions, but he couldn't hear anyone else talking. He started walking towards her, bringing her back, and he said to her, Faye, no, it's Faye. I can't see you. A moment later, little Faye began shrieking and crying. She went stiff as a board, and Greg had to pick her up and haul her back inside. She was almost catatonic, and would go through bouts of total silence or inconsolable hysterics for several hours. Until Greg and Laura decided to go back down the mountain and take her to a hospital. Greg claims that he never saw anyone in the woods, and never heard any voices speaking to Faye. The doctors thought she had an epileptic seizure, and to this day Faye does not remember ever going to the cabin. When I took her, she acted like she'd never seen it before. I believe that if Faye did remember being traumatized as a child, she'd never want to go back. So I really think she's blocked out the whole experience, and when we visited it a week ago, she thought it was her first time going. In Laura and Greg's subsequent visits to the cabin without Faye, Greg experienced terrible nightmares, in which dead people entered the bedroom and sat on the ground in bed watching him sleep. In the morning, Greg let me borrow his truck, but refused to go to the cabin with me. He told me when I left, we let you kids go up there because we honestly wanted to believe there was nothing actually wrong with the place. They used us to validate their denial. But I don't hold them responsible. See, I... I'd never have believed any of this if I were them. Dreams and a frightened child do not a haunting make. I arrived in Pike's Peak around 1 p.m., and the ranger met me at the cabin. 
We investigated the place and didn't find anything unusual except that a single lampshade had been removed from one of the lamps and placed on the couch. We checked out the nearby woods, kind of surprised to discover that the creepy, enormous dreamcatcher was still there. The ranger told me that he did not recognize it and it was not something that his people made. He told me not to mess with it until his friends showed up. He told me he'd return with them in the morning and left. That night, oh, that night, some shit happened. Greg told me that he'd hidden a 357 Magnum in the closet, so I retrieved it, and a really dope-ass purple bathrobe, and felt a little better. Don't worry, I know how to shoot and how to keep it safe. Right around sunset, I walked out to Greg's truck to grab a few things that I'd neglected to bring in earlier, and I heard two distinct voices chattering in the woods. It was snowing like crazy and the wind was howling, but above the storm I heard a gruff masculine voice and a younger adolescent male voice. They were both yammering incomprehensible gibberish from two different places. I hurried back inside and locked the door. The stuff they were saying was pure madness. It made no sense. Put them up. Up in the trees. Oh, take it, take it. Walk on down there. Go ahead. I just sat there, imagining psychotic cannibals jabbering with their tongues hanging out. Their eyes rolled back in their skulls. I figured, figured they'd come out of the woods as soon as it was dark. I tried to reach out to Faye back home, but my phone wouldn't get any reception in the cabin. The storm was too strong. I tried to play video games on the SNES, but I was so distracted by all the sounds outside, every single noise the blizzard produced caught my ears. So my imagination manifested all kinds of horrible creatures slinking around in there in the dark. When I finally went to bed, the wind died down a bit. I heard a few more voices. There was a distant, high-pitched wail that echoed across the entire mountain. It was a child crying, saying something like, Put me down in the hole. It's so deep you can crawl forever. But his voice was kind of glitched. It would suddenly become deeper, as though a grown man were doing an impression of a little kid. I also heard someone hacking and vomiting and crying, begging for help. I didn't fall for any of it. I'm 28 years old, and this is the most afraid I've ever been in my life. Even with Faye walking around like a, like a fleshy marionette and calling out to a presence in the dark of my own home around the time that I was getting into bed, approximately 12.45 a.m., there was a gentle tapping sound on the window in the living room. It was... It was soft, like a, like a neighbor who was reluctant to bother me. I stood there in the bedroom with the door open, holding my breath, trying to figure out if I'd, if I had imagined it. And then I heard it again. So I crept down the short hall and peeked around the corner just in time to see the figure walking past the windows and toward the front door. With the curtains drawn, I couldn't make out anything but a big shadow. And then, it knocked on the door. It was a gentle knock. A man's voice called out softly. Hello? I just listened intently and tried to keep silent. Eventually, he knocked again and said, Hello? I... I need to speak with you. He was speaking through clenched teeth. He was either extremely cold or extremely angry. I was carefully stepping back into the bedroom to grab the gun, but the goddamn place was so old that the doors creak. I barely tapped the bedroom door as I passed, and it squealed like a dying pig. Then the man outside said just above a whisper, I know you're there. Just for a moment, in my lethargy, I considered the possibility that this was one of the ranger's friends, or maybe maybe somebody else who lived on the mountain. I was never going to open the door, but stupidly I figured talking to it couldn't hurt. 
I say it because I immediately stopped believing that this was a human being on the other side of the door the moment I opened my mouth. I said, Who the fuck is it? As assertively as I could. The second I stopped talking, whoever it was out there repeated my question Who the fuck is while it? mimicking my voice accurately. It almost sounded like an echo. Then he said, May I come in? Please. His voice was a little shaky, but it definitely sounded like me. Unnervingly similar to me. But he was still clenching his teeth so I could hear the difference. I pointed the gun at the door. It was it was dark in the house, so he couldn't see what I was doing through the curtain and said, If you don't get the fuck out of here right now, I'll blow you in half. For those of you who don't know what a 357 can do to a person, a slug to the chest essentially makes you into a human milkshake. And that's after passing through two inches of oak door. We both just stood there for a dreadfully long minute. I started testing out my voice, groaning, whispering, muttering. I said a lot of things, but I only remember a few of them. What's your name? Little cabin for the weekend, for the weekend. You're lying. They're lying. The ones out there. La, 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 la. Yeah. You weren't always alone in there. And I'm not always alone out here. What's your name? You go up in the trees. But down in the hole, that's where you go. Oh, they're... They'll find... They'll find you. Either way. The sound of my own voice making these horrific noises and phrases set every inch of my skin on fire. I could hardly describe the physical sensation of fright. This intense, it, it almost... It, it was uh, it was almost like having a bad fever, hot and cold and wet and sticky, and all at the same time. I shouted for it to leave and said that I was armed and I considered firing off around. But that's a decision that you can't take back, and my number one rule is to only fire... When I'm certain I've got a target and a clear reason, and I'm proud to say that I can use my voice a lot better than whatever it was that was mimicking me. Yeah, I'm a soft-spoken guy, but I came down like a fucking hurricane, screaming, I WILL FUCKING KILL YOU! He replied simply in a softer tone of my own voice. I will fucking kill you! Then I went back to babbling gibberish, knocking politely on the door, over and over and over, and after another minute or two, it suddenly stopped. The last thing it said was, I know where she is. Then it kicked the door, and I mean harder than any human could possibly kick a door and ran off. The boom was so loud I couldn't believe the door didn't explode in its frame. The person or thing bounded down the wooden patio off into the snow and I swear on my life and honor it sounded like a horse or some, some other huge four-legged animal charging off into the woods. A child's laughter rang out and then... And then everything was silent. Needless to say, I remained in a cat-like state of delirious paranoia for the rest of the night. The storm picked back up, and I didn't hear anything else. I spent the whole night debating whether the thing at the door was talking about Faye. I tried to convince myself that it was just yammering more nonsense like all the voices that I'd heard up here. But the way it spoke, that sentence haunts me even now as I write this. Its voice, my voice, was... Purposeful. Strained. It chose the words carefully. It knew exactly what to say. I've been thinking a lot about what, what the Redditors have been saying about Faye being some kind of doppelganger. When I first saw the nude woman on my car, I thought that it was a trick to lure me into the woods. 
the voices lie. I thought the real face stopped me from leaving the cabin, but many of you have pointed out the reverse. Could be entirely possible, given how Faye... The Faye I took home to California is behaving. Given how she's failed all my tests, and given how her engagement ring has been missing since we got home. So I sat there for hours, considering if I should go out into the woods during broad daylight to search for my fiancé. Of course, it's a stupid idea. But now I understand why people in horror movies do idiotic things. If I'm not looking for her or for answers, why am I here? I need to know what I saw that day in the driveway. I need to know if there's many voices or just one. I need to know how to get all this back to normal. I listened to music on my iPod and desperately tried to distract myself from reading news articles online until daybreak. Most of them wouldn't load because the gods of the internet have cursed this cabin. Around 4 a.m. I, I got to get up to get some food from the kitchen and I opened the window curtain a tiny bit to see if anything was going on outside. A ton of snow had fallen. The rim of the forest, dozens of yards out, I could see. I could see a distant figure standing perfectly still in the moonlight. He was facing away, staring off into the darkness of the woods. I checked on him every 20 minutes. He never moved. When the sun rose around 6.15, he was gone. I never saw his face. Today, the ranger and his two buddies came to the cabin as promised. They were instantly likable and warm. One of them, Tiwe, was a medicine man in his 50s, and was especially cool. The other was his son, Nathan, who was probably just a few years older than me. They told me all kinds of interesting lore about Pikes Peak and surrounding areas, and then proceeded to tell me a disturbing story that they believed explains the strange activity on the mountain. For the sake of, of brevity, I'll relay this message in my next post. The ranger gave me one of his facility satellite phones to stay in contact with them in case emergencies. I used it to call Faye, but she didn't answer, so I called Jason and Richard, who were persistently caring for her. Apparently Faye had become inexplicably outraged after taking a shower and threw an enormous tantrum and locked herself in our bedroom. She refused to eat for the rest of the night. Allison and Jason slept in the guest bedroom, and Richard slept on our couch downstairs and worked late on his commissions. He's a, he's a digital artist. He told me that around 1 a.m., same time that I had my visitor, Faye ran downstairs into the kitchen, eyes closed, and started drinking out of the sink faucet. Then she turned around and stared, eyes still shut at Richard while he sat at the breakfast table. She said, Felix, to which he replied, he's in Colorado, Faye, remember? But then she said, we sent him there to die. And she sat down, right on the kitchen tiles, and went back to sleep. I've instructed my friends only to wake Faye if she does anything serious, so they observed my rules and got her back in bed without much of an issue. For all the crazy shit Faye does when she's asleep, at least she never gets violent. The guys put her back into the bed easily enough the next day. Allison bailed on the whole project. She said that she was awake all night listening to Faye whispering through the wall. Faye told Allison about how there's a man in the house and he was asking about her. My flight home is the next day after tomorrow, so I'm going to have to figure all this shit out real quick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a nap. It's nice and bright outside. No voices. Good night. Uh... Uh, P.S. As soon as I get home, I'll put the Faye video up. I know I, I keep saying this, but I really did not expect to suddenly return to Colorado. I swear I'll put it up, and that will be the end of it. I resent myself for, for turning this into such a, such a long and ridiculous blog of experiences. My first night back in the cabin was the most terrifying experience of my life. You can hear about it in one of the previous posts, but... The next morning, Wednesday, the ranger showed up with his friends. Tiwe, a Pueblo medicine man, and his son, Nathan. These people were amazing. 
They were instantly likable and sympathetic to my situation, and I mentioned them in a tiny update in my last post, but here's what happened. It was the lore and legends. Tiwe is an incredible storyteller. He tells me that Pike's Peak in the surrounding area was inhabited by the Ute, the Minotau, the Arapaho, the Pueblo, the Anasazi, and other Native American groups at various times. In the 1860s, when the gold rush was in full swing, many Indians were violently displaced because of mining operations there. They were torn away from their sacred lands, which was catastrophic to their cultures. Tiwe stressed that historically, Americans have not understood the significance of land and names to the Native Americans, and this is critical to understanding the supernatural presence of the mountain. The major world religions like Christianity and Hinduism and Islam are universal. They can be practiced anywhere. You can pick up your whole life and move to Kentucky or Scotland or Istanbul, and you'll still be whatever religion you are. Your God still hears your prayers. He still intervenes in your life. But Native Americans practice land-based religions. The land they inhabit is a part of their creation stories. It's not that the land belongs to them, it's that they belong to the land. And both are in symbiotic relationships with one another. History is embedded in the landscape. A person is reminded of specific lessons and wisdom when they see a part of the land. The mouth of the river has a story attached to it. That fallen tree has a story attached to it. A battle was won here. A chief died there. Peace was made between tribes with a feast here. When a native group is forced out of its homeland, the people lose their history. What's worse, they leave behind the places where their dead are buried. Since the dead are bound to that place, the Indians who left no longer have spiritual connections to their ancestors and thus to their gods. Their medicines and magic no longer work. They forget the names of sacred places as the names and history and wisdom are forgotten. The tribe's spiritual power evaporates. Tiwe said that when Pike's Peak was taken, a group of disgruntled Utes descended on the miners and slaughtered a bunch of them. Because a complex network of alliances and peace treaties, these Utes were punished by another tribe. They dug holes in the ground and slit the Utes' throats. They then buried them upside down in the holes with their legs sticking out of the ground so that wolves would feast on their calves. That was supposed to be the end of it. But then something else happened. The legend says that these dead Utes arose from the tainted ground one night. Because their flesh had been flayed from their hips down, they looked like walking skeletons. They hobbled into the Arapaho camps and took women and children back up to the mountain. They forced them down into one of the mines, never to leave again. The howls of women and children have been reported on the mountain for over a hundred years now. The Utes in Arapaho engaged in blood feuds, sometimes called mourning wars for years over this. They exchanged curses, executed and skinned and tortured each other. They stained the once sacred earth on Pike's Peak with rivers of blood. I was pretty mortified by the story. I just kind of, just kind of sat there with the ranger while T-Ray and Nathan blessed the cabin. They burned sage and tobacco inside and outside and used crushed herb dust to cover their hands. They made a, a handprint on every window and drew small symbols and ash at the top of each door inside and outside. They gave me bundled sage, cedar, hawthorn, and told me to burn it if anyone tried to get inside. It drives bad spirits insane. Then they provided me with small pouches filled with herbs and blessed objects to wear around my neck and in my pockets whenever I went outside. Nathan gave me a totem that he wears around his neck and told me to give it to Faye. Then they sang a really incredible chant in their language. It lasted about 15 minutes. I was blown away. I, I fucking love these guys. And then we went outside. I showed them the Dreamcatcher, and they told me that they'd never seen anything like it. The Dreamcatcher is made with tree branches woven together with hair, and it has old yarn or wool string with glass beads crisscrossing the center of the pattern. It's old, handmade. Tiwe told me not to touch it or move it. If you find an object of power and do not know who made it or what it protects, you should leave it alone. I asked him if it could be evil. He said, maybe. I got them up to speed on everything that's been happening. I said that a lot of my friends, the Redditors, but I didn't explain that, expected that Faye at my house in California was a duplicate 
and that the real Fay was somewhere in the woods. Tiway and Nathan disagreed with each other on whether that could be possible, but we searched the woods looking for signs of Fay. We found nothing. I told them about the missing ring, and they said exactly what many Redditors have said. If Fay loved the ring, and it was a powerful symbol to her, it could be used by a bad spirit to harm her. They told me to find it at all costs. They also told me that if Fay indeed was still here on the mountain, she was certainly dead. In the moment that we've all been waiting for, Tiwei named the creature that was tormenting us. He said his people called it the imposter. Bad spirits inhabit the land everywhere, and sometimes they get the opportunity to use tragedy like the Pike's Peak Massacre to commandeer a human figure and walk the earth partially mortal. In the case of the imposter, they collect animal and human parts piecemeal wherever they can, stitch them together. This is why they walk strangely, vocalize strangely, and when they never show their faces or come out during the day, they, they can't pass for humans. See? I asked Tiwe why I always see someone facing away from me at the edge of the forest, and he said it's because it doesn't want me to know its identity. But eventually the imposter will come for me, wearing face, skin, and teeth, and hair, and try to convince me that it was her. And when I asked him what it wanted, he said, Nobody knows. He also told me that there is a power in names, and as many people have said, I should not speak its name. Especially not to it, because that could provoke it. Of the voices I was hearing in the forest every night, Tiwe said they practice what they hear for decades. It makes it easier for them to hunt. But the really freaky shit... Tiwe, Nathan, and the ranger left at sunset, and I spent the rest of the evening thinking about all this, and I think I figured out a lot of things. Around 9 p.m., something disturbing happened. I used the sat phone that the ranger gave me to call Faye. She actually answered, and she was just lying in bed reading. We had a great conversation. I told her I missed her so much and that I was up here trying to solve what was happening. I told her I wanted to... I wanted to have a family with her. She said she was feeling better. She actually got a whole night without sleepwalking or terrifying Jason and Richard, my buddies who were looking after her while I was in Colorado. And after about 15 minutes of talking, I started hearing sounds outside. I heard footsteps crunching on the dry snow, and I heard a voice. I heard my voice. I said things like, Flight. Insomnia. Miss you. See you soon. I think I'd been standing near the window, mimicking my conversation with Faye. I told Faye I'd call her back later and hung up the phone. Then I went silent. The thing walked around the cabin slowly, trying to figure out if I had moved. I kept mumbling and repeating a few phrases as it went. Finally, it came and knocked on the door. Its knocking was gentle, just like last night. I was a little bit less scared because of all the blessings Tiwi had put in the cabin, but I still held on to the gun just in case shit went down. He spoke to me in my own voice, and the first thing he said was, The hole will fill with no. And blood. So yeah, that, that amped up my fear quite a bit. Every hair on the back of my neck bristled. Do you know the feeling of being so scared that your vision turns hyper real? Everything looks like a realistic video game, so everything looks just slightly off. Then it knocked again and said, Hello? May I come in? I said simply, No. Leave. And then it knocked for another 30 seconds or so, and said, What's your name? Hello? I lied, and I said, 
My name's Daniel. Now leave. You can't come in. The thing started knocking harder. A lot harder. Non-stop. And said, What is your name? What is your name? It was terrifying to hear my voice coming from the other side of the door. And to hear rage building in that voice. I said again, My name is Daniel! But the thing just kept yammering and asking the same question. It was occasionally saying things like, Ticket. Ticket. Rental car. You go up in the trees. The hole. The hole. Down in the hole. What is your name? May I know your name? Then I had an idea. I was really good with fake accents. When I was a child, my first language was German. My dad immigrated to Boston and met my mom. I, I started speaking in a thick accent, talking about my day, and then started shouting in German. I, I recited a poem I knew. Uh, uh, my visitor went silent and stopped knocking. I could tell it was just listening, so then I started shouting in a British accent and reciting lines from V for Vendetta, which is one of my favorite films, and I, I shouted thank you in every single language I know. I once committed to hearing it in 100 languages and stopped around uh, somewhere in the 20s, but my unwanted guest just sort of stammered a bit, trying to mimic me but failed to do so. I was no longer speaking in any recognizable pattern or tone. Eventually, it just started growling the sounds Faye and I heard in the forest when we first stayed at the cabin. What you what you my oh my And it began scratching and pounding on the door. I grabbed the sage bundle and torched it with my lighter and waved it around the door frame. I didn't know if the thing outside could smell it, but it walked off the porch, all pissed off, growling, and went off into the night. This time I ran to the window and tried to catch a glimpse of it, but I all I could see was a very dark, amorphous form disappearing into the trees. I think I figured out a lot of stuff. I think this entity is mimicking me because it's going to try to convince Faye that it's me. It's rehearsing my voice and then whispering to Faye while she's sleeping, talking to her in her dreams, trying to get her to let it inside of our house. I think it, it wants to convince her that I am the imposter and not it. I think... I think I also figured out why the voices go crazy at night and why they're getting closer to my home. These, these fuckers aren't trying to scare me. They're trying to deprive me of sleep. If I'm psychologically and emotionally drained, I'm weaker. If I'm delirious, I'll make a mistake. Their or his attempts to get at me will be easier. I'm still trying to figure out how controlling Faye like a puppet in her sleep plays into all this. I know, I know what I saw. There was a man standing outside our home, walking the exact same creepy way that Faye was sleepwalking at the exact same time. I'm also considering the possibility that I also made a terrible mistake and that the imposter has already won. See, when I went outside for the first night at the cabin with Faye, trying to see where the voices were coming from, I left the door unlocked. That's the moment when Faye was replaced with something else. I don't know what to think, but for now, I'm going the fuck to sleep. There's so many new developments, it's hard to figure out how to cram it all into a uh, short post. The morning after I spoke with my fiancé, Faye, on the satellite phone and then was visited by the thing that mimics our voices, I got a call from Richard and Jason. In case you don't remember, they're the two best friends and they're, they're staying at my place taking care of Faye when I'm gone. They're the only people that I trust. Richard stays up very late and sleeps in the morning, kind of like what I'm doing now. He does this for two reasons. One, to work on his art commissions, and two, to make sure that Faye doesn't stab everyone to death and burn the house down in her sleep. The guys report that she's behaving quite normally and feeling good or being productive during the day. But then at night, she is... She is unpredictable and weird. I feel like her soul is being cleaved in half. The two distinct sets of behavior are drifting farther from each other every day. Around 1 a.m. that night, Richard heard the voice of a young child mumbling incoherently. He's up to speed on all the unusual experiences that have been plaguing my fiancé and me, so he immediately got up to investigate. He looked out the kitchen window. 
which faces the same part of the forest where I saw the man mimicking Faye's sleepwalking movements. Richard didn't find anything, so he walked a circle around the house and realized that the sound was coming from our bedroom window. He went inside and woke Jason up. They stood outside the bedroom window listening. They claimed they heard the distinct sound of a child whispering, softly singing. Bet you can guess the song. I'm a naked soul, Miyadu. The song Faye and I heard outside the cabin on our second night, sung in a child's voice. Both of these dudes are super ripped climbing enthusiasts, and they said that they had never been so creeped out in their entire lives. Jason knocked on the door and said, Faye, who's in there? I promptly heard the child say, shh, and whisper something inaudible. Richard pushed the door open, said that Faye was standing in the corner of the room in the dark facing the wall. She was standing up on her toes, dragging her hands and nails down the wall, talking to herself, with her back turned to the guides. She said, oh, their skin is perfect. Which one, which one put him down in the hall? Richard saw something out the window, hurried over to it. Jason stepped inside the room and reached out to put a hand on Faye's shoulder, but she whirled around quickly and covered her face with her hands. Her eyes were open, which is unusual for when she sleepwalks. And then, these are the exact words Jason used. She started speaking in the voice of a little kid. She made whining and crying sounds and rocked back and forth on her feet, cradling her arms as though she, she held a child. She turned around and started scratching at the wall again, still whispering in that kid's voice, saying things like, It's Faye. I can see you. Are you up in the trees or down in the hall? Then she started singing again. Richard ran down the stairs and out the front door, barreling towards the tree line. From the window, he had seen a small child walking around on its tiptoes, flailing its arms up in the air. On the phone, he told me that he could hear it singing while he watched it from the window. When Richard got to about 20 yards away from the kid, it took off running on the balls of its feet, heading straight into the trees. Richard stayed in pursuit and went in after it. It was too dark for him to follow, and he, he lost the kid after a few moments. He wandered around for a few minutes, searching the area, and eventually heard the voice of an adult male. Richard says, Richard says he walked a few steps deeper into the grove and saw a huge man standing about 30 feet away, completely naked, looking up into the trees. There were lacerations or dark pock marks of some kind all over his body. Uh, Richard's about six foot one, 210 pounds, a bulky, muscular guy. He said this dude was way bigger than him. He said the man was perfectly still for several seconds and started rolling his head around, cracking his neck loudly. Started making gurgling and mumbling sounds. I guess Rich was paralyzed with fear because he claims he stood there for an entire minute or more before running like hell back to the house. As he turned to get out of there, the man let out a long... As he did, his voice transformed. It became my voice. Richard said that the thing in the woods called out with my voice several times as he fled, wailing, Please help me. They're going to kill me tonight. They're going to kill me tonight. Jason says that he didn't hear or see anything out the window, only Richard running back inside. Ghost white with terror. He said Richard actually cried. While they talked in the living room, Faye sat at the top of the stairs just watching wide awake. With a little smile on her face. The next morning, they took her to a psychiatric appointment. The first that she had ever had. I'll hopefully hear back on that soon. It kills me that I'm not there with her now. I'm stuck at Pike's Peak. It's like this place doesn't want me to leave. The ranger station shut down the entire road network in the mountain because of this huge blizzard that rolled in. And there's avalanche warnings. But my road up here is completely iced over. One part of it has a snow collapse, this mini avalanche. Shut up, I'm from California where God pays attention. I'm in contact with a ranger. His name's Greg. 
Just like Faye's dad. That's why I avoid referring to him by that name up, up till now. He assures me that they're working on getting the roads cleared every time that it stops snowing. I missed my flight, but thankfully they gave me a voucher so I can just roll into the airport whenever I can. Yeah, I have enough food to feed an army. The electricity here is surprisingly reliable, so I'm warm. The Wi-Fi dips out... Honestly, for like five to ten hours at a time, though. I'm working on Donkey Kong Country 2. Secret of Mana on the SNES. And writing about my experiences here in my spare time. I also slipped on the icy porch steps and fell on my side, so I've got an enormous bruise and it hurts like a bitch. But only when I breathe, so... I got that going for me. One of the guys asked me if the cabin has a basement, and you know, I'd never thought to check. Outside under the snowpack, and a halfway covered with old chopped wood, I found a little locked door. The key was in the kitchen cupboard, and it turns out there's a decent-sized cellar under the house. Down inside, I found a ton of creepy shit. And there's a bundle of long black hair, several, several dozen jars of... of some rotten, mutant-looking shit. Tons of old books from the 60s and 70s. Lots of porno mags. There's also a lot of sticks and yarn. All the material necessary to make a dream catcher, like the one hanging at the tree line behind the cabin. I didn't touch anything. I just nope straight out of there. I've been thinking about something. Something that someone had said to me the other day, which was, have you considered that it's not a dream catcher at all? I mean, and he's right. I'm no expert on Native American symbology or artifacts. It just looks kind of like a dream catcher to me. So I've been calling it one all this time. Tiwe, the Pueblo friend of the ranger, he didn't call it that. He just said to leave it alone. I'm wondering if that thing attracts the imposter instead of keeping it away. It could mark the house. I mean, I kind of want to move it for one night to see what happens. After all, T-Way blessed the entire cabin, so I... I feel... safe. And I have a 357 Magnum in case... in case leaves don't protect me. At about 9.30 a.m., there was a knock on the door. I grabbed the gun, suspecting another encounter with the imposter. It was lightly snowing and gloomy, so I figured the sun was blocking enough that the creature would be willing to come out of the woods. But then I heard familiar voices, talking cheerfully. I looked out the window, and to my surprise, it was Tiwe and his son Nathan. These badass motherfuckers had hiked up from the ranger station in the snow to check on me. I let them in, and they made tea. I can't tell you how happy I was to see them. Tiwe brought me his own dream catcher. It was, it was one that he had made specifically for me, and told me that I should hang it beside the creepy one. Very colorful one, and it's really ornate. I could tell that he spent a lot of time on it. It's got two beautiful hawk feathers dangling off of it, which Nathan says represents freedom and unboundedness. He reiterated the importance of finding the engagement ring that Faye had lost and blessed the house once again. I tried to get them to stay longer, but they had to get back down the mountain before the storm picked up. He told me that I should come with them. We all knew I wouldn't. If I left with them, I'd be leaving Greg's truck and I'd Never have found what I'd come back for. He said goodbye. Tiwe hugged me. Yeah, I wish that guy was my grandpa. I took a nap after they left. I figured out how to sleep without being interrupted by the goddamn voices in the forest. From 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's pretty quiet outside, so I napped on and off. But something really, really bad happened this time. I woke up opening the bathroom window. I'd never sleepwalked. Never before in my entire life. Faye's been sleeping next to me for five years and she says, I don't move, I don't speak, I don't snore, I don't even steal sheets. I'm the most polite bed buddy on earth. But when I came to, I was standing next to the toilet, both hands prying the frozen window open. It was about two inches up and the freezing cold wind on my fingers is what woke me up. I slammed it shut again and checked all the windows, ensuring that they'd all been locked and sealed tight. Then I went back to bed. 
I dragged one of the living room chairs up into the bedroom with me and propped it against the door so that I'd knock it over if I got up again. This did not work. At around 1 p.m., I woke up standing at the front door and found myself pulling it open. The loud groans it issued were what snapped me out of my stupor. I slammed the door shut and looked out the window next to it, praying nothing was out there waiting for me at the tree line. I, I saw nothing. Then I remembered that I'd... I'd had a dream. Images of a huge hole carved into the mountain surface at my... It was in my mind. Snow and branches were, were caked all around the mouth of the entrance, and, and an impossible, yawning blackness emanated from within. In the dream, uh, I just kind of stood there, gazing into the vacant face of the deep, listening to Faye's weakened cries. I sat down on the couch and just sort of cried for about a half an hour. I, I thought about what our lives had become and now I, how badly I missed her. I thought about, about all of the dreams that we had of our future, the things that can never be if I don't figure out how to save her. I thought about all the promises I'd, I'd never keep if I die up here. I decided it would be best to hang the Dreamcatcher sooner than later, because the clouds broke for a while and it was fantastically bright out. I got geared up and trudged across the snow with Tiwe's gift and hung it on a branch about three feet away from the evil-looking one. And that's when I saw it. Faye's engagement ring. It was dangling right there, right in front of me, as if to tease me. Someone had woven it into the strings of the Dreamcatcher. I stood there for a long time, right, right between the two objects. I couldn't figure out if some benevolent force was giving me a break or if I was being taunted by whatever beings had haunted my footsteps ever since I arrived on the mountain. Retrieving the ring would require me not only to touch, but destroy the creepy Dreamcatcher. See, I, I had the thought to come here and ask what I should do, but I feared that if I, if I left even for one second, the ring would be gone when I got back. So I tried to solve the riddle myself. You know, how I wish I'd brought that satellite phone out with me. After a few minutes of standing there, I reasoned that T-Way's Dreamcatcher would probably do just as well in protecting me if, in fact, that was the function of the original one. I also figured that if, if it was cursed or something, touching it couldn't actually be worse than leaving the ring there and allowing Faye to be completely consumed by her madness. If the ring has anything to do with the creatures who are controlling Faye and me while we sleep, then getting it back is priority over not touching the weird stuff in the woods. So that's what I did. I broke the brittle thing apart and I, I took my goddamn ring back. What else could I have done? And as if on cue, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. It was a person standing in the snow beside a tree, about 12 feet from my left side. I was so scared, I didn't look directly at him. I just watched him in my periphery and prayed that he hadn't noticed me. It was a man, black and gray hair and dark clothes facing away from me. His head was tilted all the way back, and he was looking way up at the tops of the trees. His limbs looked mangled and bent and elongated. Even without looking right at him, I, I slid the ring into my pocket as slowly as I could, trying not to make a sound as I, as I did. The man hobbled around and faced me. I really didn't want to look now. I slammed my eyes shut. I knew he was looking at me. I could feel his gaze on me. He started gurgling and making throaty noises and said in a voice so threatening I can't even begin to describe. Felix, I know you. Felix, I know you. Felix, I know you. Over and over and over, 
I took off running and screaming like a bat out of hell. I screamed all the way back to the fucking cabin. I barricaded the front door with a couch and burned up half the sage that I had left. I even prayed like like an actual prayer. I haven't done that since I was I was 15 years old. I'm really struggling to write this last part. It's been oh taken me hours to finish this entry because I keep getting up to distract myself. The ranger isn't answering his phone and nobody at the station, maybe, maybe the power's out. I don't know what I did by breaking that dream catcher. I don't know what tonight's going to be like, but Faye, Faye, if you ever hear this, if, if, if something happens to me, don't forget your tenderness, your softened skin. All I needed, your love is my tourniquet. You have to say this even though I desperately want it not to be true. The man that I saw was Tiwe. Things have spiraled out of control up here on the mountain. I made a decision that changed everything and it almost killed me. Only time will tell if it was the right choice to make, but for now, I'm just piecing everything together in my mind and trying to convince myself that... that... I'm one step closer to solving all of this. I destroyed the strange dreamcatcher that's been dangling on a tree branch behind the cabin since Faye and I first came to this place. Nobody knows who made it, what its purpose is, or why it's on the side of the tree facing the woods, rather than the side facing the house. I found all the supplies to make another one just like it, locked behind a cellar door that someone tried to hide years ago. But when I broke the dreamcatcher, I learned everything I needed to know. Tiwe is dead. A lot of people have said otherwise, but I'm certain of this. I saw his likeness stretched over the gruesome form of the thing that stalks these woods. It was broad daylight, and the look on that... that thing, it, its mangled face, told me exactly what I didn't want to accept. I really am all alone. Several Redditors have speculated that this thing only shows itself at night and always faces away from me because it, it can't convincingly appear human. Not without the help of the recently dead. Tiwe confirmed this during his first visit to my cabin, but when I destroyed the Dreamcatcher, there it was. Proudly masquerading in the skin and hair of my... my best friend on this mountain. In the sunlight, no less. Not even imagine how his son Nathan must feel. Or even if he's alive. The two hiked back to the ranger station from the cabin, knowing a blizzard was coming. I'm sure that's when Tiway died. When I got back inside the cabin, I completely lost it. I barricaded the doors and windows with every piece of furniture I could, but there just isn't enough stuff inside this little cabin to protect me, so I sat there on the floor against the bed, clutching the gun. Sort of, sort of wishing my dark visitor would come and kill me already. But of course, this is Pike's Peak. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to you here, so the mountain kept fucking with me. It was getting dark. I was on the verge of a, of a total psychological break. I've been running on four hours of sleep per night and a few naps for the past two weeks, my only hope for redemption just got turned into a puppet. And I was about to find out what happens come nightfall when the Dreamcatcher no longer functions. So what did my brain decide was the best course of action at this point? Oh. To fall asleep. Somehow I nodded off. In fact, I think my brain just did a, a hard reset because nothing about the sleep was restful. I just went into a fear coma the moment that the sun dipped behind the mountains. Then I woke up. I was in bed with the sheets pulled over me. The lights were off, all of them, and my hands were empty when before they held Greg's 357 Magnum. When I opened my eyes, I, I supposed it was possible 
that I'd climbed into bed myself. After all, I'd caught myself sleepwalking twice the day before, but it, it took me a solid minute before I realized there was a fucking arm wrapped around my chest. I didn't have the reaction you'd expect. Most people would fly out of the bed screaming bloody murder, but the first thought I had was, uh, where am I? My parents divorced when I was three, so as a kid, I'd spend a few nights at my dad's house a week and a few nights at my mom's. Sometimes I'd wake up in the dark and not be sure which bedroom I was in. It always took me a second to remember where I was. This is... This is the thought that crossed my delirious mind. Maybe I was back home in California. Maybe I was at Faye's parents' house. In Arvada. I sort of rolled out from under the arm and tried to figure out who the hell was lying in bed with me. I'd been sleeping with the lights on for the past few nights, and I'd never in my right mind have turned them off after seeing the creature so, so close to me only a few hours ago. The body in bed beside me felt familiar, its warmth, its texture, it, its... I was pretty sure it was Faye. But I couldn't remember if she was really with me up here. She, and she spoke. She, she reached through the dark and touched my face and said, What's wrong, Pop-Tart? Yes, that's actually the name that she gave me. I wasn't really afraid, just overwhelmed with confusion. I asked her where we were and why the lights were off. She just squeezed my shoulder and said, Honey, we're in Pike's Peak. There's a storm. The power's out. It's done this before. What's wrong with you? I got up out of bed. A feeling of dread was falling over me. Heavier and heavier, the more awake I became. As soon as the sheets were off of me, I felt a, a blistering cold, colder than it's ever been in the cabin. The heat must have been off for hours. Only a bit of pale moonlight filtered in through the windows, and it was, it was barely enough to outline the objects in the room. I stumbled around looking for the flashlight, totally unable to remember where it was, and said, Why the fuck is it so cold? Did you, did you screw with the heat? Faye tried to get me to come back to bed. She told me it went off and came back on earlier, and that it would probably be back on soon. Everything about her felt wrong, but her voice was perfectly clear. Her skin felt totally recognizable. I couldn't, I couldn't shake this strange feeling that I had. I left the bedroom and walked out into the living room. I was, I was even colder out there. I felt my way around with my hands and noticed a strong icy draft coming from down the hall. It's a straight shot from the living room to the bathroom at the other end of the hall, and from where I stood, I could see the bathroom window. It was wide open. It was wide open. A big two-by-two-foot gap leading out to the snow. I went to shout, What the fuck did you- But Faye stepped out of the bedroom and stood in the hall between me and the bathroom. She said something like, Felix, you aren't feeling well. Do you not remember what's going on? You're sick. I almost believed her. Because I definitely felt dizzy and feverish. But it, it could have been the mixture of disturbed confusion and freezing cold. The thought that this was not really Faye invaded my mind, and I immediately regretted not, not knowing where the gun was. The only words I could find were, Who are you? Why are you here? They just stood there in the darkness of the hallway. The only thing I could see was a little sliver outline of her figure. Her face was entirely black, but even though her eyes were hidden, I could feel them burning into me. Just as T-Ways had when I found the ring. It felt like we stood in the eye of a hurricane. Everything was totally calm, but I knew hell was about to break loose. There was... There wasn't a single sound outside. No branches snapped. No snow crunched. No voices moaned. It was as if time had stopped completely. Faye didn't move. 
Even as she spoke, she held herself with the stillness of death. She said, Felix? It wasn't to get my attention. It wasn't to convince me that she was really my fiance. It was a threat. She was reminding me that she knew my name. I still didn't fully understand what the power is in names, but Tiwe and Nathan believed it. And many, many others have warned me about it. When she said my name, I felt smaller than her, even though I stood almost a foot over her head. Do you remember the five? She asked. She didn't move an inch, not, not even her hair kicked up in the drafts that blew in from behind her. I can't remember. Not in this place. I didn't know how to respond to this. I didn't know what she was talking about. All I could say was, get out. You're not welcome here. Again, Faye didn't move, but she did clear her throat. And the sound she made was about two octaves deeper than the real Faye's voice. She inhaled sharply and said, Tell me about the number five. I remembered where I was, what day it was, and exactly what had happened up until this point. My visitor had finally come to call, and it it no longer needed to be invited. I deeply regretted breaking that dream catcher. My, my hand instinctively slid over my pocket. To my relief, the little shape of Faye's engagement ring pushed back against my fingers. There was nothing else to do. I decided to throw down the gauntlet. I figured it was probably time to die anyway, so I might as well go out bravely. I just said, I know who you are, and you will never be Faye. She took a menacing step towards me. A gurgling seeped out from her throat. She inhaled again, more slowly this time, and demanded, I want to know about the number five. Tell me, Felix. I looked around me on the counters for a weapon, but found nothing. The knife block was on the other side of the short wall that divided the living room and the kitchen. There was only a roll of paper towels within reach, but in, in retrospect, I was so amped up with terror that I probably could have beaten her ass to death with it. I don't have a clue what that number means, I said. In fact, about 5,000 people online don't either. Nobody knows. Only Faye knows. My visitor started shaking with rage. Her face was wreathed with impossible black. There was an endless abyss that stung my eyes. But then I realized something. This creature, whatever it is, has had access to Faye's mind for several hours every night. Maybe for many years. Maybe even since she first visited the cabin. When she was five years old. And in all that time, it still hadn't learned everything about her. It could never perfectly imitate her because she kept something buried so deep in her subconscious that not even this thing could find them. Whatever the number five meant to Faye, that deep place is where she kept the secret. She didn't even go there in her dreams. The next part was all a blur. I said something like, you're the one who speaks to her in her sleep. The visitor kind of nodded. I said, you ask her things. She answers you. I hear everything she says. The visitor didn't react. Then I said, You've asked her this question, just like you're asking me now, and she always says, No, no, I can't tell you. My visitor took another step forward, dragging a hand along the wall as Faye had so many times in her sleepwalking fits. It raised up on the balls of its feet and twitched violently. It said to me, I'll make you tell me. I don't make you tell me. It didn't try to mimic my fiance's voice anymore. It sucked in huge breaths, trying to control its rage. There is a certain feeling you get when you're about to die. When you're in danger, when you might die. Fear, fear completely overwhelms your senses and compels you to flee, to fight, to save your life somehow. But past that point, when you know you're going to die. That fear becomes useless and disappears. This has happened to me only 
once before, when I was sucked into a riptide at the beach during an El Nino winter as a teenager. See, in that moment I was wondering, will my body ever come back to shore? Will they ever know what happened to me? In this moment, my heart slowed down. I didn't feel cold anymore. I just stood there, ready to be mauled to death. I was satisfied in the knowledge that I had not given this creature what it wanted, and therefore blocked it from using that knowledge as a weapon against Fae. Whatever Five meant, this thing needed it to take full possession of my fiancé, and I wasn't going to let that happen. I laughed. I actually laughed, and I said, well, you're shit out of luck, buddy, because I don't know what the hell it means. Maybe you could tell me when you figure it out. <laughs> the imposter laughed right back in my voice in perfect mimicry. And then it said, well, then we don't need you anymore. It lunged at me. I've dodged a rabid German shepherd like I was a ninja. But this thing was so fast and so strong, it knocked the wind clean out of me. I toppled backward and crash landed on my shoulders on the tiles near the front door. It unleashed a barrage of blows on my face and neck. It raked my sweatshirt with razor-like claws. I tried my best to defend myself, but it was so dark in the house I couldn't see almost anything. I managed to flail my way free to grasp for just a second. I pulled myself up to my feet by grabbing the corner and in doing so, my hand brushed against the little bundle of sage that I'd been burning. The imposter was on me like lightning, grabbing me by the back of the neck and pulling me with the strength of a 250-pound man. I was very ingloriously whirled around and smashed the sage bundle into the creature's face, burnt end first, and wrapped my other arm around its head, Faye's familiar locks tangled in my fingers. I pulled its head forward and jammed the bridled sage into its eyes as hard as I could, screaming like a banshee. It shrieked and growled in some unhuman language and tried to push me away, but I held on as hard as I could and kept driving my fingers into its eyes, crushing the twigs in them. A memory of Nathan and Tiwe's chance surfaced in my mind and I shouted the only part that I could pronounce. My hand slid over its face and the mockery of Faye's appearance fell away. I couldn't see in the dark, but the face no longer resembled my fiancé's. The mouth was too big for a human's, and the wet lips draped across the maw of a hundred fangs. And that was it. The bastard had had enough. It screamed and growled and took off on all fours, its limbs elongated as it moved farther from me. Its shape became recognizably inhuman, even in the pale light. It barreled up against the bathroom wall and out the window, and in moments... It was completely gone. I definitely am not afraid to cry. I do it at funerals, at weddings, during the Hunchback of Notre Dame. But I'm a little embarrassed to admit how long and hard I cried after the creature left the cabin. I've never felt so utterly, miserably alone in my entire life. I only stopped when the power came back on. Probably 20 minutes later, the heater kicked on instantly and I ran over to shut and lock the bathroom window. My satellite phone was gone. The gun was gone. Probably outside in the snow or up in a tree. Down in the hole. I peeked out the kitchen window and saw something lying on the porch. Right near the front door. When I cracked the door open just for a second, I saw that it was T-Way's dream catcher. It had been destroyed and placed in front of the cabin, mocking me reminding me that I was unprotected. I checked the timer on the little battery clock in the kitchen, and it read 12.15 a.m. I was going to have to spend another night in this godforsaken cabin, but I vowed to myself that at daybreak, no matter the conditions, I would take Greg's truck and get down the mountain or die trying. I didn't care if I slid off the cliff face. I'd never watch the sun go down in Colorado ever again. For a while, I actually considered leaving right then in the middle of the night. Many people have reprimanded me for not doing this before, but I assure you, even in this situation, driving in the dark on the icy little road next to the 400-foot cliff is a complete nope situation. The mountain had other plans for me. At one point, I risked sneaking outside to determine how deep the truck was buried, but as I approached it, I saw the snow had been dug out around the two front tires and they'd been slashed to ribbons. All I could do was let out a grim laugh 
and trudged back inside. At least it was warm in there now. At around 1 a.m., the voices started up. They arose far off in the woods, several of them at once, groaning and screaming dark elegies into the night. It was all the same evil gibberish that I'd heard a thousand times before, but they slowly made their way into the open field and eventually to just outside the cabin. I lit the remaining pieces of sage and did a once-over on all the windows that weren't barricaded with furniture. I also donned the medicine pouches, an amulet that Tiwe and Nathan had given me, hoping they'd be similarly effective in protecting me. Then I remembered Tiwe's useless dream catcher and imagined my crumpled corpse lying in the snow beside it. Outside the front door, I distinctly heard my own voice calling. Faye, it's me, Felix. Let me in. Let me in. I turned the bathroom window, my voice again saying, Hey, sweetie, I miss you so much. It repeated a few other things I've said on the phone in conversation with her, and even a few things I said to her while she was sleepwalking back in our home in California. There were footsteps on the roof, two, maybe three pairs of little feet stomping all over the ceiling, voices of crying children paired with them. I stood there in the kitchen, clutching a knife and the herbs, waiting for the end. The voices circled the cabin as though a handful of deranged lunatics were slowly marching around the perimeter, singing the songs of hell as they went. They begged for help, they laughed maniacally, they whispered and screamed and talked entirely to themselves all at once. Their dim shadows passing over the window curtains, over and over. I heard glass breaking in the bedroom, and then in the bathroom. The stomping on the roof grew louder. The voices at the front door grew more urgent. Someone began knocking on the door, and the others tapped on the living room windows. They all screamed, Faye! Faye, let us in! Felix? Are you there? And then, as if heaven sent, a blinding white light illuminated the entire cabin from outside. All of the window curtains at the front of the house lit up, and the sound of motors drowned out the hellish cries. Someone had driven up to the cabin. I heard doors opening and men calling out coherently. The footsteps on the roof thundered overhead to head back into the woods. And then the screams of children drifted off into the woods out back, echoing as they withdrew. The ranger bashed on the front door, calling out my full name, instructing me to come outside. I looked out the window and saw five men, some in uniforms, and the ranger. There was a humongous off-road snowplow, two snowmobiles, and a big truck. They'd come to save my life. When I went outside, I just walked up and hugged the ranger. I didn't even grab my winter jacket. He informed me they were getting everyone off the mountain because of a problem with the power grid. He said he feared I'd freeze to death. The ride down the mountain would have been the happiest ride of my life. Except for the view. We snaked across the slippery white roads, and even with the truck's high beams on, I could see the brightest stars I've ever witnessed. But beneath them, dangling in the trees, were dozens and dozens of human bodies. They swung by rope from their feet or necks. Some of them were flayed or missing parts. The ranger didn't appear to notice, and I kept my mouth shut. As I passed overhead on our downward crawl, I could almost make out their frozen faces. Lifeless for years, maybe decades. Their black blood stained the trunks of the tree, and I'm not sure if they were the spirits Tiwe talked about or if they'd... They'd simply been me experiencing temporary insanity. I'm not sure I'll ever know who they were, but I, I'm guessing that if the ranger showed up any later, I would have become one of them. I'll never forget the haunting image of passing underneath them. We arrived at the ranger station and remained there overnight. I slept on a cot in a room of about 15 people. All locals from different places on the mountain. I asked the ranger if he'd heard from Tiway or Nathan, but he said he had not. The next morning, one of his men drove me straight to Denver International Airport, and I boarded a plane without any luggage whatsoever. Doesn't matter. I had the ring in my pocket, and I'll never need another jacket again as long as I live. When I finally got home, Faye let me have it. She kept kissing me and yelling at me. I understood. She was angry that I'd spent so much time trying to take control of the situation, retreating 
treating her like a child and disregarding her feelings in my crusade to rescue her. She was upset that I, I co-signed her to take care of my best friends without asking, but seemed to appreciate their help. Richard and Jason were very happy to leave my house and never looked Faye in the eye again, although they did have some good news for me. Faye had not sleepwalked or sleep-talked or done anything out of the ordinary in over 24 hours. This corresponds almost exactly for when I retrieved the ring from the Dreamcatcher. After an hour or so of reprimanding me for being a thick-headed idiot, Faye forgave me. We laid in bed together and talked about everything. I apologized to her for the way I was treating her. I put the ring on her finger and she looked relieved to have it back on. I swore I'd never screw up like that again. We both slept a full night, no strange night terrors or bad dreams or sleep disturbances of any kind. And in the morning, yesterday morning, we had Faye's favorite, <laughs> waffles. At around 11 a.m., I received a call to my great relief. It was Nathan. I immediately pressed him for information about T-Way and what exactly had happened after they had left the cabin that day. He ignored my question and said very ominously, please let me speak to the one who followed you home. I said something like, what? To which he replied, the one that calls itself Faye. My wife and I had been sitting on the couch watching the most recent Game of Thrones, so I sort of handed the phone off to her and said, it's for you. She put the phone to her ear and said, hello? And then listened for about a minute. I could hear Nathan speaking. I couldn't make out what he was saying. Suddenly a volcano of black puke exploded from Faye's mouth. It absolutely covered the couch and carpet and sent me nearly jumping out of my skin in the process. Faye doubled over onto the floor like a rag doll, coughing and sputtering. I fell to my knees beside her, panicked, asking if she was all right. I picked up the phone and screamed at Nathan, demanding to know what he had said to her. Nathan just said, please, Felix, please listen, and then proceeded to recite some sort of chant or incantation. A wave of syrupy vomit rushed up my throat and out of my mouth, and as with Faye, it was oily and black. I'm actually an emetophobe, so vomiting sends me into a state of near catatonia, but Faye had made a quick recovery and was right there to nurse me back to my senses. Nathan spoke to me a bit more and explained what he had done. I'll get to that in a bit. Faye and I spent the rest of the day feeling queasy and eventually went to urgent care across the road to get checked out. They gave us blood tests and checked our vitals and sent us home, telling us that we'd suffered minor food poisoning, but I know deep down it wasn't the damn waffles. Thankfully, for the past several hours, we've been feeling much better. I mentioned a while back that Tiway and Nathan had a disagreement over who was the real Faye and whether it was possible for a duplicate of my fiancé to exist. When they hiked back down the mountain from the cabin a few days ago, they had to go up into the forest to avoid the snow collapse all over the road. Out there in the woods, they had the crying of a woman and followed it to an abandoned mine. Both of them knew it was very likely a trick, but Tiway said that it was their duty to explore the possibility that Faye was alive somewhere on the mountain. The blizzard came on earlier than they expected. They stood at the mouth of the mine, listening to the begging of a young woman somewhere off in the dark, but concluded that its voice was too unusual to be a human's. Tiway and Nathan decided to bless the entrance of the mine, which could ward off its dark inhabitants. But their chanting enraged whatever lived in it. It came out of the tunnels and snatched Tiway. He screamed all the way down into the dark, and Nathan could not follow. He ran away, terrified. But got lost in the blizzard. He wandered for an hour, fearing death, and eventually came upon a skinned body swinging from a low tree branch. It was so fresh, the blood hadn't yet frozen. Nathan knew it was his father's corpse. Eventually, he found his way back. He said his father's voice guided him out of the squall. Nathan explained to me that the imposter's goal of taking over someone's mind was different from its goal of killing people. These creatures hunt and kill at random salvaging the human's parts they need to walk the earth as mortals for a short time, but their real pleasure derives from conquering a person from within. 
Faye was one of the unlucky few that are chosen in this way, and the imposter's fixation on her had lasted for decades. After long enough, their continued presence in the body and mind of a victim leaves a stain on the soul. This corruption necessitates a purge, hence the barf party that we held in the living room, whose stains, by the way, I have thus failed to banish. Nathan invited me to the funeral ceremony for Tiway, and I sadly declined, as I'm already on the verge of losing my job and flat broke from this experience, but I promised that I'd honor his memory in my own way. I can't go back to that place. Fortunately, Nathan was more than understanding and promised that we'd meet again soon. I'm still thinking about all this. I, I do not yet have all the pieces of the puzzle. If you're looking for all the answers, you're going to have to help me find them. But I think I have part of this figured out. The imposter gave Faye's ring back to me. They wanted me to destroy the Dreamcatcher. The ring was an object of great sentimental value both to Faye and to our relationship. The creature used it to invade Faye's mind and control her thoughts. Its goal was to convince her that it was me, so that she would welcome it into our home late at night. The home Nathan said symbolically represents the body, just as the ring represents our union. To be welcomed into the home is to be granted access to Faye. But because the imposter could not learn everything it needed from Faye to mimic me, it gave up on that project and instead came after me. It returned the ring to me, thus giving me its power over Faye, but it broke the Dreamcatcher to retrieve it. As it turns out, that creepy, mysterious Dreamcatcher was, in fact, protecting the cabin and everyone inside, which is why the imposter needed to be invited in. When I broke it, that creature could easily come in and kill me, but it needed information from me before it did. It needed to know one of Faye's darkest secrets to rule her. I'm not sure I'll ever unravel the mystery of the number five, but I do know one thing. Not knowing what it means actually saved Faye's life. I'm not sure I ever want to know. As for Faye, she's back to normal and in perfect health. She sleeps soundly and only mumbles a bit, which is pretty normal for her. Her sick sense of humor has returned as well. Last night, she went to sleep. She turned out the light and said to me, Thank you for trying so hard. And then she leaned over and licked my face. <laughs>